Stand up, if you would, please. Hold your Bibles up high. Welcome all of you watching online. This new series today, I believe, is going to point us in the right direction. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment, and I want to pray uh, for the upcoming Tuesday elections. Um, it's been a hard-fought fight on both sides, and uh, there's a lot of passion and uh, a lot on both sides, a lot of anger. And I just want to pray for peace, and I want to pray for wisdom. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very important that we allow Jesus to guide us and direct us. And our footsteps should be ordered by him and everything we do. So if you join with me in prayer, Father, we, we just uh, declare peace over the upcoming elections on Tuesday. Uh, Lord, we want to do the right thing, vote the right way, and, and so many different opinions and ideas and uh, so much passion. that God, I think we've even lost our way in the clouds to figure out what to do and how to do it. So we need you. And so I pray for everyone, Lord, listening, watching, uh, everyone in the house today, that you would uh, give us the insight we need to do what you desire, not what we desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, it's time to, it's time to just say peace, 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 Lord. Um, you know, it's, it's just it's, it's, it's disheartening when humanity... Uh, gets in a place where we're at right now of, of thinking we're right, which fits in with this series pretty perfectly entitled True North. Um, very, very important that we understand what this is, and I'm going to try my best, and I'm going to ask, while I'm reading this, I'm going to ask our ushers, I, I did something just a little different. How many of you ever ordered something on Amazon that looked bigger than what it really was? Yeah, I, I can tell all of us, so that's kind of what happened. So if, if, if you're older, not old, you may need glasses. I'm going to ask them to pass these out. There are many compasses, many and many. And so, but the idea is this. If, if you have an office, if you're wherever you are in the house most of the time, just simply place this in that room, on that desk, on that counter, to remind you that, that there is a true north. And uh, that varies if, if you don't have uh, any kind of compass. And I, I would say this, there are, there are several kinds of compasses. One is a moral compass, and another is a biblical compass, and another might be a, uh, um, an inherited compass or a human compass that you came by it by how you were raised, and, and your true north to you may be based on how you were raised or what your parents believed or your family has believed throughout generations. And it's very hard to trade in that compass for a biblical compass and, and even maybe a, a moral compass because morality uh, varies from culture to culture. I don't know how many of you have traveled the world or been out of our country, but there are different cultures that have a different north, if you will. There are things that you and I would look at and go, man, that just does not bear witness with my spirit or my soul, and that is not my north. I mean, that just, I can't believe they think that that's true north. That, that, that it's, um, it's a sad thing. And uh, so, but we have to understand that. Now, a compass works this way. Using a magnetized needle that rotates to align with the Earth's magnetic field, which points toward the North magnetic pole. So, you know, no matter which direction you turn that, your North is it's always going to pull to that, that point on the Earth's magnetic field. That's where it's going to go. And, and so it, it's saved a lot of lives. It's... Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, Siri is confused. I don't know how many of you Siri lately, but she keeps, she, she's messed up. She's, I mean, it, it's just crazy. We'll be driving along and say, turn left, but it says here, turn right, you know. And, and so it, it, we're trying to get guidance to get to where we want to go. And old school compass is, is still 
probably the most accurate. Now, it doesn't tell you what address and where how to get to that address, but you can at least know what direction you're going. And so the challenge in our world today is I think that there are many, many people who have an idea of, of what they want, but they don't know how to get there. They don't know how, how, how to make that work. And so there are so many varieties of true Norse with regard to forgiveness, uh, grace, mercy. Uh, if you have a human compass or maybe even a moral compass, um, th there's this sense that if somebody does you wrong, that you don't forgive them until they ask for your forgiveness. That may be how you were raised. And, and it really sounds pretty good that why should I forgive someone who hurt me and said bad things about me and has done wrong things toward me or about me or with me? How, how should I? Well, you know, your human mind says, well, you know what? They ought, to, they ought to have to ask for my forgiveness. They ought to come and tell me they're sorry. Well, that may be good and right, but that's not, that's not true north. I mean, that's not a biblical north, better yet. That's not a biblical compass because we're called to forgive even if somebody doesn't ask for forgiveness. And so you, you can see that there are good things and bad things, and, but, but the, at the end of the day, it's the righteous thing that really matters. It's the biblical thing that really matters. And so when you're setting course, you have to realize that your, your focus is on Jesus. He is... He is literally the magnetic pull, if you will, the true north in every believer's life. That, um, I'd like to know what happened. Uh, <laughs> it's not my phone. Uh, that's, that was north. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. This is, people watching this are going to think we're new age. How mystical is that? It's like, wow, our true north rings. Um, okay. Wow. That's interesting. So anyway, let me try to get back to where I was going. Uh, this, the idea came when I was thinking about what is it, what is the standard in my life that, that keeps pulling me in the right direction? And the only standard I can think of is Jesus. It's, it's not how I was raised. I mean, I was raised in a, a very good home and even a Christian home. But let me say this to us. I have watched Christianity uh, be explained in a variety of ways uh, where good people talk about things or Christians talk about things that they determine are good or bad or whatever. And, and yet we still have issues with gossip which nobody ever talks about that. We talk about drinking, smoking, chewing, cussing, all those things. We talk about, and those are the standard. You know, they're not the standard at all. The standard is Jesus. That's, that's the standard. And, 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 and aside from all that, all of the gossip and the murmuring and the whining, and, and most times churches don't even talk about that. They just simply talk about the things they're comfortable with. Their true north is what you don't do instead of what you do do. And so it, most when you get born again, first thing I thought about was my true north was I don't want to sin the way I've been sinning. So my whole focus wasn't on Jesus. My focus was on my ability to do good and to, to, to be good and, and to make every See, that's called works. And works in many people's lives, and especially religious people's lives, true north to them is not doing wrong. But true north to the believer is focusing on Jesus and doing what Jesus wants us to do and the way he wants us to do it. That's the true north. And, and so if your focus is on not doing something or trying to be good, you're going to miss out on what Jesus really is wanting us to do and be. And so if you focus on sin all the time, the likelihood of you not sinning is not as likely as you are going to sin because your focus is on sin. And so getting that focus on true north and saying, I'm going to make Jesus that point. So if I'm having a day and something's going on, I'll say, Jesus, I love the thing. It was overdone, but what would Jesus do? 
that was a great little thing to carry around, wristbands and all that, and it's still great. But people kind of, it became a, a piece of jewelry. It became something that, that really we didn't want it to become. We wanted it to be a reminder that we want to do what Jesus does. We want to act the way Jesus acts. We want to respond to people the way Jesus responds to people. So a true North statement would be mercy triumphs over judgment. So the minute you start judging someone, you go to your, your needle should go straight north and says, no, show mercy. When sin becomes abounding in your life, go hold it. No, no, no. Grace abounds even more. I'm going to grace. And, and, and I'm going to focus on grace. And when, whenever you get angry at someone and, 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 and you, you begin to just get so frustrated, you say, Paul, I'm going to forgive without even being asked if I would forgive them. And these are things that will remind us that that compass keeps us pointed in the right direction. Let there be noise and more noise. A moral compass guides us in making ethical decisions. What is moral in this country, like I said earlier, or was headed to before we got the phone call, uh, is <laughs> the morality is different. So in our country, we're very conservative, and we, we, we have certain dress codes that we live by and ways that we live, and, and, and there may be reasons for that. Maybe it's because we have the resources to do that, but... In other countries, one of my first out-of-country experiences, I was asked to do a youth congress in the southernmost part of Mexico. One flight in, one flight out every day, and that was it. You, and, and then when you got off the plane and you took public transportation, and I'm not exaggerating, there could be pigs and chickens on that bus. It, I know it was, it was an eye-opening experience for me, to say the least. Then they take me to a place they call the hotel. No exaggeration. I check in. I go to my room. There are no windows. There are just holes in the wall and no glass. Yeah, this is, this is like God saying, so you really want to speak around the world? Yeah, you think it's all glamorous and people traveling. Trust me, there was nothing glamorous about this. And, and so... I, I thought, okay, that's fine. I, you know, I kind of felt like I was roughing it, and that's all good. And, you know, you're kind of feeling like a missionary all of a sudden, you know, like, yeah. But then they come to get me, and not, not in a limousine, not in an Escalade, not in a car, but on foot. Now, we're going to go to the building, and there are people coming from all over Mexico, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of people coming into this Congress, and and so we're walking to, to the venue, and it's dirt floors and open air and all this stuff. But en route to that venue, there was this big place in the center of town, and it was a wash place where everybody in the town that wanted to wash their clothes came to wash their clothes. But now here's the problem. They didn't have a closet filled with clothes. So the women would wash the clothes topless. This is National Geographic stuff. And so I'm from America. And I'm walking through going, oh. <laughs> you know. I was, like, I was like, I don't know if it was obvious or not, but I'm going, Hooters has set up in Mexico. <laughs> just keeping it real. I'm just telling you. I'm like, and, and, but no, and, and then they don't act. There's nothing about it that's sexual like we have sexualized everything in America. It was how they lived. This is what they had to do to survive. This is what they did to be clean. And it would be very easy to start looking at their culture and start addressing their culture instead of pointing north to Christ. And saying, you know, we're going to love Jesus. I could disagree with them all I want, but all they would they'd probably respond to me and say, we have nothing else to wear. We're washing what we have to put back on. Do you see what I'm saying? And so when we start talking about true north, we have to be very careful to not try to become the compass to everybody else's life. You and I have to be responsible for our lives. We have to make our decisions. And, and there is a variety of, way to, a variety of ways to look at this. 
and we have to be very careful because the church historically, when I say the church, I'm talking about Christianity has a tendency to want to clone people into our image and likeness instead of the image and likeness of Christ. And so the image and likeness of Christ, if you were to ask me, what's that look like? First off, it looks like love. Why? Because he is love. So if I can't do anything with love in it, I probably shouldn't be doing it. Because otherwise, I could quickly become the judge to everything and everybody. And the fact is that my compass over time, I've watched my compass move and true north has shifted. When I first got saved, I really wanted to do everything right and be good. And every time I made a mistake, I felt like I was sinning. How many of you know if there, there is what I call, this would be misquoted, I'm sure, innocent sin. In other words, you didn't even know you were sinning. You had no knowledge. Why? Because you didn't know at that point enough about the Bible to know what God said about it. So when people get born again and they don't read the Bible, they cannot have a biblical compass. And if they don't have a biblical compass, how can you expect them to go in the direction that God's called them to go? This is the reason you come to church, the reason you read the Bible, the reason you try to learn and grow is to dial your compass into where you are living a true north life. A life that honors Christ and glorifies God in our behavior and those kinds of things. And, and, and that, that varies. I mean, what's acceptable to some people may not be acceptable to me and vice versa. I can't judge that. And, and so we spend most of our time, listen, looking to somebody that we like, know, or respect to become our north. My mother was initially my north. Not Jesus. My mother was my north. I thought if my mother believes this, then it must be right. So she became my north. And as good as my mother was, and as much as she loved God, she was not God. I heard my mother get mad. I, don't, I mean, I heard my mother get offended. I heard my mother gossip. Now, don't tell her mom I'm sorry, but I did. Okay. And, and so over time, you, you just embrace it. Well, you know, if that's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. And, and so she became my true north. And maybe you look to somebody, you get born again, the person that leads you to Jesus, you, you look at them and they become your true north. They become your compass. And, and not that that's not good that, that, that Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. How many of you know I don't follow Christ perfectly 24-7? So if a pastor even becomes your compass, you're going to be jacked up, messed up from the neck up. I promise you, you're going to be a wreck from the neck. Because, because everybody makes mistakes. So the point I'm wanting, the, the foundation I'm wanting to lay here today as we go into this series is realizing that you and I have a responsibility to seek out and search out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And that, that the reason I'm saying this is people who hate grace will hate this message because all I'm saying is over time, and even Jesus came in and totally had the religious people messed up because he addressed the Old Testament. He said, you said an eye for an eye. Well, he changed that. He said, it's no longer. But see, that law was the compass of the Old Testament. That if you mess me up, you poke my eye out, I'm going to poke yours out. You, you say something bad about me, I'm going to say something bad about you. And, and, and we gave ourselves, or we being the Old Testament people, gave themselves permission. That was their compass. And Jesus said that, that, that basically said, no, 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 that, that's not it. At least that's not it anymore. And so over time, you will find yourself changing and shifting, and hopefully you have a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset. And what happens is this. Yeah, you hope that your compass is always pointing, pointing north, but what happens is if you don't stay true and fluid with Jesus, there's a really good chance over time you will discover change in your life that needs to be made, but because you have a fixed mindset, you will not adjust. I had a fixed mindset that the denomination I got born again in was the only one going to heaven. That denomination became my true north. That if I go to this church, I believe what this church preaches 100%, I'm good. No, I'm not good. 
because I found out things, and it wasn't that they were evil, and that was their true north, and if that's their true north, I, I just have to keep realizing I am responsible for my north, period. Nobody else. And that I was going to have to adjust my life by the Holy Spirit, going from glory to glory, which means a part of that time, that compass is going to keep doing this because I'm still seeking that true north. There was a time that Billy Graham, and I may have shared this, I don't remember, it, it just it stuck with me. He was at the inauguration of then-President Bill Clinton. Well, being the good Christian that he was and the great leader that he was, and he was the compass, actually, to many, which is not fair and not right. So he was highly criticized for sitting at the table with Bill Clinton because many people didn't like Bill Clinton. I liked him personally. I, I really thought he was great. <laughs> just kidding. I just loved that he was so easy to mimic. But somebody criticized him, and Billy Graham being a man who I believe really had a true north life that was focused on Jesus and love. And so somebody criticized him. He said, you know, his response was this. It's God's jo job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's Jesus' job to love. He said, and I'm called to be like Jesus. I'm not called to be like God and judge. That's God's going to judge. Holy Spirit's going to convict. In other words, we talk, we become the Holy Spirit more than anything. You know, I don't know if you know that, but... We, we wear a Holy Spirit cape often. We want to convict everybody of their sin, their wrong, their bad, or whatever it is that we determine they've done wrong. But Billy Graham, that great statement was, I'm called to be like Jesus, which means I'm called to love. That is a very hard standard because sometimes it feels like you're hypocritical or we're hypocritical because we, we, it looks like we're enabling somebody whose compass is not in the same place as ours. And, and that's what makes everything so difficult is that we have this a tendency to believe that our opinion, our upbringing is the true north that everybody else should follow. But if I could say anything about true north for me, it'd be, look, if you will find love in your heart toward everyone every day, then you will find your way to the north pole of Jesus Christ. You'll find that. But if your job, you think your job is to seek out everybody else's salvation so that they fear and tremble, the scripture is out of line. And, but but we, we constantly try to get people to be like us. And I don't know if it's because we're insecure about what we believe. And if I can get 50 people to believe what I believe, then what I believe must be right. You can get a 1,000 people to believe what you believe and doesn't make it right. And there's one thing that you can always be aware of. And in my, this is, these are things I'm learning over time. is humility says, you know, I could be wrong. And you could be right. It's my response to people now all the time is, if, even if I know I'm right, and there are a few times I do, not many, but there are a few times that I think, you know, I think I'm right here. But then I look and I go, well, you know, I, I could be wrong. And you know what? I could be really legitimately. Now, there is one thing that I'm not wrong about. And even if you would disagree with me, I say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. Now, th that's, that's one. I won't even argue with you. I'll smile at you. I'll love you. But that is my true north. Now, the church I grew up in, speaking in tongues, was their true north. Now, some of y'all say, what is that? And, and, and I, I know many people didn't, weren't raised that way. But, but th there, if you said, well, they'd ask the question, are you full of the Holy Spirit? Well, prove it. And their, what their proof was, if you spoke in tongues. Well, you know what I found the proof to be? If I walk in the fruit of the Holy Spirit is primarily my responsibility. Not discounting the power of the Holy Spirit, not discounting tongues. But what I'm saying is that was their true north. So once you got saved, the next pull that they put on you was, this is what you need to do to really be full of the Holy Spirit. Well, what I discovered in my life is that 
the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Those are the things that became my north. Because I already knew I had the power of God in my life. Once you get Jesus in your life, you get the Father and the Holy Spirit. They're inseparable. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. And so over time, I had to realize I was utilizing a compass, not just my mother, but I was using the compass of the church I was in. There are things you're going to disagree with me on, I'm going to disagree with you on, but what I would say to you is this, if that is your north and Jesus is at the center of that, who am I to say to you, you're wrong or right? Now, I could say, you know, if you came up to me and said, you know, I hate somebody, I'd say, well, you know, hate's probably not the best thing you could do because the Bible talks about it. If you hate your brother, how can you love God? But I could say, you know, and, and so I, I, would, I would try to move the needle of your north, but I wouldn't be disparaging i wouldn't be unkind i would be loving and you know why i would say it because love is the only thing that never fails and so you're going to have contradictions you're going to have difficulties in life you're going to have people in your world that disagree with you and if your goal is to get them to agree with you you become the compass your goal is to get them to agree with the word of god and and that takes time and let me tell you how people start doing it is when they see that you love them even when they're different than you. I used to go around begging people to get saved and, and, and pointing out scripture as to how you get saved. And then once you get saved, how you're supposed to live your life and, and so on and so forth. And what I found is that if I take in information from the Bible and it gets in my soul and it begins to work in my soul and I begin to process through that filter, that my life begins to change. Not until then. Because otherwise I'm going to be mad because I'm just trying to be good. And grace is more important than good. You'll be good if you're full of God. You don't have to try to be good. You have to just be filled with God, with the Spirit of God, with Jesus. If you're full of Him, you will begin to live a life like Him. And so one of the things that we have to really determine is, I'm not going to hate anybody. I'm not going to hold unforgiveness toward anybody. I'm not going to judge anybody who does something different than me. I mean, I can go Scripture on you after Scripture, and I don't know why the first miracle of Jesus was turning water into wine. I don't know whether it was just to create fights in the church. I don't know. But where I grew up, that was their compass was abs- You couldn't even play cards. You couldn't shoot pool. You couldn't swim with people of the opposite sex. They called it mixed bathing. I thought, we ain't got no shampoo in here. I'm just, I, I'm just going to be a series because the reality is that if, if we will all stay in our lane, if I will stay in my lane and say, look, y'all can do what you want to do, but here's what I'm doing. This is my north, and I'm not changing until the Holy Spirit changes me. But you have to find a north in your life, a standard in your life. The reason our country's upside down is there used to be what was called a gold standard. Money was printed according to how much gold and minerals we had. And now we're printing money without a standard. That's why we're in debt. And so you have to have a standard in your life to not go spiritually bankrupt and in debt to to all these people that you messed up and and you owe love to. Because that's all you owe. Owe No man nothing but love. That's what we're called to do. One says good typically refers to moral excellence or virtuous behavior. It encompasses actions, intentions, and qualities that are considered positive and beneficial to others and society. Grace, on the other hand, often relates to the concept of unearned favor or kindness. Particularly in theological context in Christianity, it signifies God's unconditional love and forgiveness offered to humanity regardless of one's actions. So we go around, and and yeah, everybody wants to be good, or a lot of people do. But the reality is, there is no one good, the Bible says, not even one. So if goodness is your north, 
you're going to be disappointed for the rest of your life. If your goal is, I'm going to be good, you're going to be sad. Because nobody can be good 24-7. So the goal is not to be good, but to tap into the grace of God and recognize that God is giving us unmerited favor because we're pointed toward Him and He is our heart and soul and goal. That's it. And so during this season of differences and elections and there's just so many people that are so angry and so just so adamant that they're right and I, at the end of the day let me just tell you <coughs> at the end of the day <coughs> nothing escapes God nothing escapes God and if somebody said well you know how should I vote you need to vote according to the Bible what lines up with the Bible? What lines up with the Word of God? And it's not what looks good for me, not what I like, not driven by personalities, not even driven by promises, but driven by the best you can. What aligns itself with the Word of God? That's the true north. What aligns itself with the Word? And if you are where you are, wherever you are in life, make that your goal is say, God, help me. That's it. I can only ask you to be led by the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, there are going to be people on both sides that are Christians, and, and, and their north is, I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. How can you argue that? You don't know anybody's heart, neither do I. Now, I, I, I know what I want. You know what you want. Everybody in this room knows what they want. There's no question. You've already got it dialed in, baby. And, and, and there are already parties waiting, and, you know, everybody's, like, getting excited, and I'm going to win. No, here at the end of the day, let me tell you what's going to happen. The Bible is the blueprint and the map to the ultimate end. And if I were teaching an eschatology course today, I could tell you all kinds of things that would make you think it's close. By, the armies from the north will attack from the, the, from the north, Gog and Magog, and they're all modern-day Russia and Iran and all these things that are going on in our world today, and, and they scare people. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but news stations only typically give you bad news, and they'll throw you a good news bone every now and then. That's it. Why? Because fear seems to move people more than good things. I was watching a, a, a news report about a shooting last night, and I tried to get up, and, and, and I'm thinking, why do I need to know this? Why, why, do I need, why do I need to know this? It's none of my business. What good is it? Why are you showing me this? What good are you doing? Well, what they're doing is they're instilling fear. And guess what? Fear is not from God. He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. So the whole goal is to rob you, gradually erode your faith and erode your confidence in a good God. This is the whole goal, is to get our focus on the bad so that it can get, get our eyes off of the goodness of God. And so at the end of the day, to me, honestly, I'll wake up Wednesday morning no matter what happens, and guess what? My compass is still pointed north. It's still pointed toward God. I'm not going to get uptight or upset no matter what happens. I'm just not going to. You know why? Because God's not asleep. And if everyone after Tuesday and wake up Wednesday, I can look and I'm just going to tell you, even if the person I vote for doesn't win, Jesus Christ is still Lord. And I'm going to get up and I'm going to say, well, God, here we go. <laughs> We're off and running, and you haven't changed. What the devil meant for harm, you're going to turn for good. And I don't care what side you're on, whatever happens, God's got you. I could pull on you and one, I could pull on you, but here's the deal. I, I, what do you think the other 11 disciples talk about Judas Iscariot? This was our friend Jesus. We followed him and be. And, and, and I look at Judas and I go, man, I am so thankful for Judas. And you look and say, what kind of crazy pastor are you? Let me tell you how crazy I am. Because he betrayed Christ, Christ went to the cross, I'm saved today. And it was prophesied that he would. And so I'm going to get mad at Judas. Yeah, he, he, he had my friend killed, 
my Savior killed, but he became my Savior because he was crucified. Now, you can think about Judas what you want. I've talked about this numerous times, and theologically, I've processed this over and over and over and over again. And I don't know. I know Judas hung himself, and which then that's the second problem with Christianity, is you're going to hell. That's what I grew up. If you take your life, you're going to hell. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. Now, I know he altered, maybe altered his life, but he did what he was assigned to do. I, look, I don't even want to get into all this, but I want you to understand, we have condemned people to hell based on our opinion and our own ideas and ideals. We've condemned them. Now, I don't know what would have happened. I just know throughout Scripture it was prophesied this would happen. So do you think that God says, I'm going to take one man... And I'm going to use him for my good, and then I'm going to send him to hell. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, okay, I was born to go to hell. Nobody was born to go to hell. God says, it's not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when I read Scripture, it, it looked like to me Judas was very sorry for what he did. He suffered great pain for what he did. So much pain that he said, I can't deal with it. We have to be very cautious to not become the compass of everybody's life. If I could say one thing to you, determine in your life, not your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, your best friend, your pastor. Don't let anybody become your true north. Jesus is your true north. And in the Bible, all we have to do is look and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I mean, all you have to do is look at all the people in the Bible that God used that were way off track. I mean, I, I can go as far back as Eve. And, and women, this is not. The man's dumber than you. After all, he listened to you more than. I mean, at least the devil tricked her. It didn't take nothing but another woman to trick the man. It's still the same today. Well, thank you. I'm just saying, and we pick on people, but starting with Eve, God has the first man and woman he creates, and the devil comes who is absolutely a brilliant liar. Let me just give him that. He's a brilliant liar. So he seduces Eve into eating, and then Eve goes, hey, take a bite. And man went, <laughs> it began there. And then we go, we, we can go to David. We all know David committed adultery and then murdered the husband and all. I mean, and, and, and then we got Peter who goes around cutting off ears and denying Christ. We got Paul who's crucial helping kill the church. And yet he's writing most of the books of the New Testament. We, wouldn't, we would have had these people condemned to hell. But Jesus showed us what true love was. He showed us what true north is. And I know that in its purest form, there are people that refuse to change their compass and they're going south. Don't go south with them. And when you, you say, well, how do I go south with them? When you, when you just continually criticize their southern behavior they're going south decisions instead of loving them out of the south. See, when you love somebody, it just keeps pulling that needle north. It may drop again when you're gone, but when you love them, you're showing them what north looks like. That I'm not, what did Jesus say? I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So if I'm going to be like Jesus, now please don't miss this. I know there are corrupt people that you can't be around. I get that. That if you walk with a wise, you grow wise. A companion of fools comes to ruin. I get that. But even in the midst of all the difficulty and disagreements that we have, we have to maintain that true north focus. In everything I do, I have to look and go, okay, Jesus. How do you want me to handle this? And sometimes you'll do the right thing and you'll get the wrong response. Not from God, but from people. 
And so what happens is when you do the right thing for God and get the wrong response from people, two things happen. One is you get mad at God. Two, you get mad at them. And they, they're, nothing good happens out of that. My thing is always leave an open door for healing in every relationship. Every one of them. There are people that I've had grand and gross disagreements with that I've just said, you know, I'm not going to harbor them in my heart. My true north is to love them because that's what Jesus does. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Is it important? Extremely important. And in Christianity, we, we touch on topics that are sensitive, but we don't talk about topics that are sensitive. I'm going to talk about topics that are sensitive. And this is one of those. Because every one of us in this room has weakness in our lives. Every one of us in this room has a past. Every one of us in this room probably judge ourselves more harshly than others. And, and so it's liberating to me to know that if I keep Jesus at the, at the, the point north in my life, I remember forgiveness, I remember grace, I remember work, mercy, I remember patience. And the Bible says it's the kindness of God that leads man to repentance. Not the wisdom of man, not the intelligence of man, not the tenacity of man, but the kindness of God. And you, like Billy Graham and like Jesus will be criticized for being around people that other people won't be around that call themselves religious. Be careful who you judge because the Bible says you will be judged by the same measure you judge other people. All I have to do when I look at somebody that I get startled by something that they did or said that what I have to realize is they're different than me, or I'm different than them. But it doesn't make me better than them or worse than them. It just means I'm different than them. And that, that makes it easy for me to love them because I'm not going to stand before God for them. I'm going to stand before God for me. And some of y'all have a list. You cannot help but control your environment. You go around and tell everybody else what to do. How to do it, when to do it, where to do it. And if they don't do it your way, that's called being controlling. I live an out-of-control life. Why? Because my life is controlled by him. So I, that means I'm out of control. And sometimes you look and go, yeah, I bet you are. Yeah, I am. But it's not by design. It's by default. How many of you know that we often default to humanity? We often default to our original sin. We often default, not because we want to, because it's so easy to. When I first got saved, every night I'd go to bed and I'd beg Jesus that if, he, if I died or he came back, forgive me, don't let me go to hell. I, I, my whole point was I was scared to death of God. I was scared to death of dying. I was scared to death of doing wrong. And you know, that's what religion does to you. Religion will keep you trying to be good in your own strength. That becomes your compass. And let me tell you, your compass is broken if you think you can achieve the goodness of God by the power of man. It will not work. And so when I talk about true north, this will be liberating for many of you. If you are religious, it will be agitating and irritating. But you probably don't want to talk to me because I'll just look at you and smile and go, I love you. But pastor, you said, I love you. Because if you're going to try to, my thing is, I can't tell you other than this, the footsteps of the righteous are ordered by God. If you are righteous, and then you'll allow God to order your steps. We don't move. We move too often by personalities and people we like and people we want to be like instead of saying, I just want to be like you, Jesus. And, and I draw boundaries. I tell people, I said, what's right for you may not be right for me. I don't do crowds well. And I used to try to do crowds well. And every time I did crowds, I was uncomfortable. I just don't do crowds well. And finally, when people say, we're going here or there, I look and say, you know, there's nothing wrong with you doing that. But I know I don't have the capacity, nor do I have the desire 
to put myself in a situation that I may not be able to handle. It's liberating to identify your weaknesses. It's liberating. I have, I have these things I can't do. And I, I, I think, God, but, but I should be able to. And the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah, but God made me who I am. God made you who you are. And there may be things you can't do only because God said, I didn't make you to do that. And there may be things I can do that you can't do that will cause you to judge me because you can't do them, and I can. Y'all look like a cow at a new gate. And all you can do is, mm -hmm. you're going to be a quarter pounder if you keep this up. <laughs> Guess where I'm at in my walk with God and my walk in life and my age is this. I spent most of my life fighting more ways than one. And I realized that when Jesus, if I follow the life of Jesus, he didn't spend a day fighting. He just lived his life. He said, I know what I came here to do. Seek and save the lost. And that's what he stayed on track to do. People wanted to make him king, and then they wanted to, they wanted to crucify him, and they did. But because he stayed so true north that he never allowed people to make him king without a cross, he stayed true to God. And he never allowed the criticism, the anger to keep him from being forgiving. He could have called legions of angels to rescue him. He didn't. He looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Boy, that's true north right there. Father, forgive them. Please, for, praying on behalf of those that are causing you the greatest pain and suffering ever in spirit, soul, and body, that is true North Christianity. Father, forgive them. And then to say they don't know what they're doing. He's pleading for their innocence. He's supposed to be the prosecutor in the minds of religious people, but then he becomes the public defender to people that have falsely accused him and ultimately sent him to the cross. I want to live that life. And as sure as I do, somebody's going to pull out in front of me today. And I have a true north horn. I just want us to be the kind of church that people come into and go, I'm not anything like them, but I like them. I'm not anything like them, but I like them. It's getting harder and harder because people are more vocal and outspoken than they've ever been. There are more things going on in the world today than they've ever, ever been. But what I've realized is God's love is so much bigger and greater than I can imagine. That the people that I might, with everything in me, want to hate, my father loves them as much as he loves me. Now, I can't figure that out, but then I'm sure God's going, well, if you saw what I saw, you can't figure out why I love you. <laughs> to which I would say, amen, good message. I understand. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Oh, for your patience. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God that just every day continues to love us, extend grace to us giving us mercy that we don't deserve. And God, we're not taking for granted the price that you paid for us to live a holy life. That's not it at all. But holiness can only be accomplished through you. And so we put ourselves in you, towards you, focused on you. Fill us, God, to the point where we wouldn't want to hate we wouldn't want to be mean. We wouldn't be, want to be unkind. We wouldn't want to be judgmental. We wouldn't want to talk about people different than us. Because who are we to talk about others when we ourselves have so much going on in our own lives that are either undealt with or we haven't overcome yet. 
Help us, Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'd like to ask all of you to pray this with me, if you would. Pray it out loud. Say, Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I declare today I'm born again. Amen. Prayed that prayer today. I want to ask you to text the word saved to the number on the screen, 405-513-10. And those of you watching online, some of you beat yourself up. Some of you are thinking about suicide. Some of you are looking at overdose. Some of you are doing all these things, and, and you think there's no way back. I've done too much. You could never out the cross or the love of Christ. If you turn to him, he's already facing you. And all he wants you from you is for you to say, here's my sin. We're not bringing him a great gift of goodness and greatness and all, we're all of that. But we're bringing him what he came to get. And he came to get your sin. Give it to him today. Okay? This time we want to receive our tithes and offerings. And I want to propose this to you as you start looking ahead in the next few days. In, in about three weeks we'll have a different look up here. Uh, we've been very blessed to have a guy that uh, works right here every Sunday on our sound and, and owns a company. He's, he's blessed us so many times, helping us uh, update our equipment. And so in a, just a few weeks, we'll have brand new LED screens on both sides of the stage. Um, and, and for some of you, it may not be a big deal, but these projectors and everything, they fade, they get old and all of that. And, and the, you can see the difference in brightness. And so we're trying to upgrade just to make the worship experience even better when it comes to visual. And so we're, we've got a great deal on these screens, a, a deal that I can't even, you wouldn't even understand. I mean, it's just crazy good. So if you want to help us give over and above toward that in the next few weeks, that would be great. No pull on it, no begging. But those of you that have the wherewithal to know that we're spending about $15,000 uh, to make that happen, which is incredibly cheap for what these things go for. So, again, if you want to give toward that over and above, I'm just letting you know there's no pressure. Uh, matter of fact, we've already paid for them. Uh, but if you want to help offset that cost, which was not in the budget, that would help us if you could do that. No pressure, okay? So if you want to give today, the QR code on the screen behind me uh, is right there. You put your smartphone on it. It will direct you to that site. You can give on your way out. You can go to our website there at mosaicokc.church forward slash give. You can mail it 5821 Northwest Expressway, Oklahoma City 73132. Uh, but I want to thank all of you who do give faithfully and tithe. It makes all of this possible. And what you see in-house is just a speck as to what's happening around the world. We have people watching us from all over the United States. Matter of fact, I just found out this week in Singapore, we have more people watching us from Singapore than any other place. I have no idea why. Uh, I know one pastor over there who has a large church that I've been with before, but I, I'm just shocked at the people that watch. And so when I say that, it's not saying that to make you think we're all of that in a bag of chips, but just to let you know that people are watching beyond what you see in this room, and your giving keeps us going to Singapore, to Africa, and other nations. So please continue to give and know that it's bigger than 5821 Northwest Expressway, all right? So I'm going to ask our prayer team to come to the left of the stage. You're right. If you need prayer for any reason, any reason, please, if you want communion, receive communion, please take time to go let one of our prayer team members pray. You say, hey, you know, it's not that big a deal. Whatever you're going through is a big deal. And if it's not a big deal now, it will be. So let our prayer team help pray you through that, all right? So please take time, just a few minutes to go over, receive communion if you want, and receive prayer. If this is your first time here, we have a gift for you. At the welcome kiosk, stop by and pick that up. Uh, also, if you want to get on our weekly call, text the word call to 405-513-10. And you will be put on that call every Wednesday night, two minutes or less. It's just an inspirational call. If you want to serve, text serve to that same number. We are always needing new people to step up and serve. So please get involved. Uh, stand to your feet with me if you would, please. And we're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. One, two, three. Hallelujah.